Interior was surprisingly sturdy and clean. There were no gaps in the walls to let the wind in, and the floorboards were brightly polished. Naturally, staying here was not cheap, but it was not completely unaffordable either. To Hecarin and his crew, no, to all workers, this was arguably the highest grade in a round. Granted, it could not measure up to the finest establishments of the imperial capital. But those places were best suited for above-board adventurers, they were not at all suited for workers. For starters, people who hired workers generally had dirty jobs to offer. Therefore, their clients would hesitate about having to walk into conspicuous locations. However, if they set their meeting point in a place with poor security, because of that, it might wind up causing trouble for them. In addition, the fact that many other worker teams used this place as a home base made the Singing Apple Pavilion popular with the requesters. That was because unlike with the Adventurers Guild, someone looking to hire workers had to find them with their own connections. Therefore, having the workers scattered all over the place was very troublesome for the requesters. Another reason for the workers to stay at this inn was because staying in the same place fostered a sense of closeness with each other, which would reduce the chances of requests where they might have to fight each other. Finally, and most importantly, the food here was delicious. Hecarin thought about dinner as he stepped through the door. He hoped that he would be able to have his favorite pork broth. While he pondered dot the topic, the first thing which greeted him was not his friends saying, oh, you're back, or thanks for your hard work. I told you already. I don't know. No, no, if you say that, it'll put me in quite a fix. I'm not that girl's keeper and I'm not her relative, how would I know where she went? Aren't you companions? I can't just walk away meekly because you say you don't know. This is my job. A man and a woman were glaring at each other in the middle of the bar come dining room's first floor. The woman's face was very familiar to him. Her face lacked the slightest trace of fat, and her eyes were vicious. The most eye-catching features of this woman were her ears, which were far longer than those of ordinary people. Still, they were only half as long as those of a forest elf's. Indeed, she was a half-elf. Forest elves were slimmer than a human being, and after seeing her body, it was clear that she had inherited that bloodline trait. She was slender from head to toe, and her bosom and buttocks lacked a woman's fullness. They looked like someone had welded iron slabs in place over them, and if one looked solely at her body, they might mistake her for a man. She wore a tight-fitting suit of leather armor. The balanced quiver she usually carried were not on her person. The only weapon she had was the short sword at her waist. Her name was Imina. She was one of Hecarin's companions. However, he did not recognize the man in front of Imina. The man appeared to be bowing and scraping, but there was no trace of apology in his eyes. In fact, there was a look in there which annoyed Hecarin. Still, at least he was being polite, so he had some brains. The man's arms and chest bulged with muscle, and he looked intimidating just standing there. People like him would probably not hesitate in using violence, but brute force was useless against Imina. That was because Imina looked frail, but she had first-rate skills, and she was capable of easily slaughtering a mook who thought he was something. That's what I've been telling you all this while. As he heard that angry, high-pitched voice, Hecarin hurriedly interrupted. What are you doing, Imina? It was only when she heard Hecarin's voice that Imina noticed him and turned around. Then, a look of surprise appeared on her face. A ranger with keen senses like herself had gotten so lost in her words that she had failed to notice Hecarin's presence. That indicated just how worked up she was. Who are you? The man took Hecarin to be an unwanted interferer and questioned him in a threatening tone. The man's gaze was keen, and he radiated an aura which suggested that he might start hitting anyone at any time. However, Hecarin had frequently faced down vicious monsters and survived the encounter, so all it got out of him was a wry grin. He's our leader. Oh, wonderful. You must be Hecarin Termite Sand, then. I've heard of you. The man's expression changed immediately, becoming an ingratiating smile, which filled Hecarin with mild revulsion. Hecarin did not know why this man had come here, but the fact that he had come to this inn, the base of operations for Hecarin's group, 
meant that it was unlikely that he did not know about what Hecarin did for a living. Perhaps his threatening tone from just now had been intended to gauge Hecarin. If Hecarin had flinched, the man would have continued speaking in overbearing tones. Among workers and adventurers, there were those people who could kill monsters without blinking an eye, but who would recoil from human beings. However, these people would only take a step back momentarily. If pressed, they would draw their weapons, and they might end up killing the opposition. We've just met and he's already trying to scare me to show who's boss, this guy. I dislike his type. Hecarin understood that this was a negotiation technique. It was also a very obvious one. However, Hecarin disliked negotiations like these. He preferred to speak his mind and get straight to the point. You're being noisy. This is an inn. There are other guests around. Do you really want to make a ruckus here? That said, there were hardly any guests nearby, and even the inn staff were gone. It was not that they had hidden away, because squabbles like this were like appetizers for workers. It was simple coincidence that nobody was around. Hecarin stared at the man's face. The other man could not hold up against the glare of a mithril-ranked warrior. He immediately cowered as though he were facing a magical beast. No, 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 I'm sorry, but I have my reasons too. The man had lowered his voice somewhat, but he still wanted to continue speaking. Given the way he was still sticking to his guns in the face of Hecarin's glare, he must have been well-versed in the application of force, particularly violence. Why did a man like this come here? It was true that Hecarin was involved in shady business, but he did not recognize this man, nor had he done anything to warrant such an attitude. Neither did he look like he was going to offer a job. Baffled, Hecarin decided to ease off on his glaring and directly asked him a question. What's going on? It's nothing. I just wanted to meet with your friend Fertsan, Hecarin San. There was only one person Hecarin could think of when the word Fert came up. Hecarin did not feel she would be connected to this man in any way, because she was a comrade who had been through countless life or death struggles at Hecarin's side. That being the case, she must be in some sort of trouble. Archie? What happened to her? Archie, right, yes. We know her as Fert San, so I couldn't recall her name for a moment. M.M., it's Archie E. B. Ryle Fertsan. So? What do you want with Archie? It's nothing, I just want to talk to her, it's a private matter, so I'd like to ask when she'll be coming back, as if I'd know. Hecarin rudely interrupted the other man. Such was his abruptness that the other man was close to rolling his eyes in annoyance. Now then, are you done yet? I it can't be helped. I'll wait here for a while. Get lost. Hecarin jerked his chin at the door, and his attitude left the other man staring dumbly. Let me make this abundantly clear. Your face is pissing me off and I can't bear to have you within my line of sight for a moment longer. This is a tavern, I oh yes. It is a tavern. It's also a place where drunkards often get into fights. Hecarin smiled evilly at the man. No need to be so tense, relax. Even if you get drawn into a fight, and in get badly hurt, we've got a priest who knows healing magic. All you have to do is pay. You'd better take more of his money, or the temples won't be happy. I don't want their assassins after me, Imina added from the side, with a wicked smile on her face. Well, we'll give you a special discount, so you'll be grateful, right? Got that? If you're threatening me, the man's words cut off halfway, because he saw the expression on Hecarin's face changing rapidly. Hecarin suddenly stepped forward, so close that the other man's face filled his line of sight. Ha! Huh? Threatening you? Who's threatening you? Fights are common in a tavern, aren't they? I'm giving you good advice here, and you say I'm threatening you? Are you looking for trouble, huh? The veins popped on Hecarin's forehead. His face was that of a man who had experienced numerous brushes with death. Cowed by his presence, the man took a step back, though he went TCH, unwilling to concede defeat. Then, he ran for the door. He tried his best to pretend otherwise, but it was clear to everyone that he had been scared off. When he reached the exit, 
He turned around and spat one last reply at Hecarin and Imina. Tell the Furt girl. The deadline's here. Ah. Hecarin's low growl sent the man fleeing from the inn. After the shouting man vanished, Hecarin resumed his original expression. That change was so great that it was almost comical. In truth, Imina was applauding him quietly. So, what was that all about? No clue. He only told me what he told you. Good grief. If I'd known, I'd had asked him to explain in more detail. He grabbed his head in annoyance. We'll ask Archie when she gets back. Still, I'm not too eager to stick my nose into others' business. M.M., all right, I understand. Still, you're the leader, so do your best. Then I'll invoke my leader's authority and order you, as a fellow woman, to ask her, Imina. Give me a break, I don't want to ask her either. The two of them smiled bitterly at each other. Both adventurers and workers had several taboos. The first was that they could not look into or ask about each other's pasts. The next was that they had to hide excessive desire. Since desire drove many people to become workers, it was unavoidable to some extent. However, being too open about it kept the team from functioning normally. For example, if a teammate whined about money, would anyone trust him when it came to a job which involved handling a large sum of cash, or when keeping a secret which absolutely could not be leaked? Would anyone dare sleep in the same room as someone who desired the opposite sex all day long? Everyone had to count on each other when their lives were in danger. At the very least, every member of a team had to trust each other. The fact that Archie had gotten herself into trouble like this was a massive blemish on her reliability. It was most definitely not something which could be hand-waved away with a simple, there, there. As people who worked a job with a very real risk of death, they could not allow any factors of unease to remain. Hecarin scratched his head, his expression clearly reluctant. It can't be helped. I'll ask her when she gets back. Please do Imina smiled and waved, and Hecarin glared at her. What, are you trying to run away? You're asking her with me. But whyyyyy Imina pouted, but she could only give up when she saw that Hecarin's face was unchanged. Nothing to be done about it. I just hope the situation isn't too serious. So where is she now, anyway? H.M.? Oh, she's gone to collect information about the details of that job. Weren't Rober and I supposed to do that? After Hecarin and the others had finished clearing the undead from the Katza Plains, they had returned to the Imperial Capital, whereupon they had received a new request. The terms of the request were pretty good for their team, so everyone was inclined towards accepting it. However, they would need to research it first. They had agreed beforehand that their best speaker Roberdick would investigate the details of their employer and the reasons why he had sought them out while Hecarin would go to the Empire's government offices, eliminating the undead of the Katza Plains was a national enterprise, and collect the payment for slaying the undead, and then help Roberdick in his investigations. Imina and Archie should have been waiting here for further instructions. In addition, she said she wanted to investigate the conditions and history of our objective. No wonder, Hecarin nodded. Archie might have abandoned her studies in the Imperial Mage Academy but she still retained her connections. Nobody could gather academic knowledge like she could. On top of that, she could consult the Magician's Guild for information. So that's why she went running around with Rober. After all, he also knows quite a bit, and has connections with the temples. Then how about your end? Well, about that. Hecarin took a seat as he spoke in a hushed voice. I know why they want workers. Or rather, I know why you can't hire adventurers to go to the place in question. However, the requester also said that he was looking for other teams, that much should be true. Are we seriously going to work with other people? They might be ruins that nobody's ever entered before, but is the requester sure that we'll get big returns from it? The team I asked, Gringham's people, said so too. Heavy Masher seems prepared to accept, and we need to decide whether or not we're accepting it by tomorrow. They had only listened to the details of the request, and they had not accepted it yet. While they had until tomorrow to respond, there would be additional preparations to be made if they accepted.
And a conflict that just happens to come up now, at this crucial time, you think it's related? We can't completely rule out the possibility that one of the other teams has a hand in this. However, we have to hear Archie out before deciding. If it's another team up to their tricks behind our backs, it would be better not to accept. Or perhaps we ought to accept while being fully prepared for a confrontation. Of course we should accept. If they have a bone to pick with us, then we'll beat them up until the only thing they're picking is their teeth from the floor. That'll teach them to mess with us. That's pretty extreme. Imina was far more intense than her look suggested, but Hecarin felt that her proposition had merit. While others looking down on them was not the end of the world, it would definitely damage their reputation. Considering workers were one foot into the underworld, it was something they needed to avoid. A determined light filled his eyes as he nodded silently, and then the sound of wood scraping rang through the tavern. The forms of two people stepped in through the open door. Back. We've returned. The first voice belonged to a girl and sounded like a whisper. A beat later, it was followed by an elegant, proper male voice. In all likelihood, he had wanted to avoid drowning out the girl's quiet words. The first person to enter was a skinny woman, someone who could still be called a girl. She looked to be in her late teens. Her lustrous hair was neatly trimmed at her shoulder, while her eyes and nose were perfectly positioned. She was not so much beautiful as elegant. However, she had an inorganic, doll-like quality about her. In her hand was a metal staff that was about as tall as she was. Said staff was inscribed with countless inscriptions which looked like characters and symbols. She wore a loose, long robe. Underneath that were various thick articles of clothing which provided her with a modicum of defense. One could tell at a glance that she was a magic caster. The man wore a suit of full plate armor, albeit without a full faced helm, and over it was a surcoat stitched with a holy symbol. He had a morning star at his waist and a holy symbol which matched his tabard hung at his neck. His facial features were rough, and his hair was parted. His tiny mustache was neatly trimmed, and he gave others the impression of being relaxed. He looked to be around thirty years old. They were Hecarin's other friends, Archie E. B. Ryle Furt and Roberdick Galtron. Oh, you're back. Was this good or bad timing? Hecarin addressed the two of them in stiff tones. What happened to the two of you? Roberdick spoke in a tone which did not sound like a senior person addressing his two juniors. Part of that was because of his character, but it was also because he viewed them as fellow, equal workers. It, it's nothing. Yeah, that's right, it's nothing. The two of them looked suspiciously at Hecarin and Imina as they waved their hands. ER, anyway, let's not talk here. We'll speak over there. Hecarin's face turned serious and he stopped fooling around. Then, he pointed to a round table deeper within the room. Before that, how about drinks? Oi, Imina, where's the boss? Imina looked at him with a face that seemed to say, why are you only asking that now? He went shopping. I'm minding the place for him. Seriously? Then what should we drink? Anything we want? I'll pass. Ah, I can go without. Really now? Then, mm, then we'll begin this meeting of foresight. Everyone's original expressions were gone now. They leaned slightly in, bringing their faces close to their colleagues. They could not help it even though there was nobody else around, one could say it was a professional habit. Let's verify the details of the request. After ensuring that everyone's eyes were on him, Hecarin continued speaking. His tone was vastly different from just now. He was serious when he had to be serious, just like how a team leader ought to be. Our client is Count Femmel, and the request is to investigate a set of ruins within the kingdom's borders, a structure which seems to be some kind of underground tomb. We'll be paid 200 up front and 150 after completion. Unusually enough, the down payment is higher than the rest of the fee, and the overall amount is very large. In addition, there might be a bonus in it for us depending on the results of the investigation. However, all magic items we find will go to the count. According to them, 
They'll pay the discoverers half the market value for anything they find. Precious stones, works of art, and so on will be valued, and then split 50 fiftieths. In addition, the requester has also been negotiating with other workers' parties at the same time, and depending on the circumstances, there might be more than one team on this expedition, proving what I said earlier. Hecarin shared the news he had learned with Archie and Roberdick, and then went on to explain the details. The expedition will be three days long at the most, and our objective is to perform a thorough investigation of the ruins. The biggest problem is that these ruins are probably going to be filled with monsters, and we'll need to scout out their lairs and so on. In other words, a standard ruin delve. Abandoned cities and the like were usually nests for monsters, and so when workers investigated ruins, it was more like a reconnaissance in force. Still, the most important thing is that it looks like an undiscovered tomb. The mood in the air changed as that fact was mentioned. Two hundred years ago, several countries had been destroyed as the demon gods rampaged throughout the land. It was not just human kingdoms which had been devastated, but those of demi-humans and heteromorphs. These ruined kingdoms sometimes concealed priceless treasures, namely, magic items. Discovering such things was arguably the dream of adventurers and workers. Therefore, adventurers and workers often longed to discover unexplored ruins. And now, one such ruin had appeared before their eyes. As he saw the gleam in his comrades' eyes, Hecarin yielded the speaker's role to his two friends who had returned after collecting information. Also, the Count will handle transportation to and from the tomb, as well as our rations. That's it. Now then, Archie, Roberdick, tell us what you've learned. First off, Count Femmel's position in court is precarious. Apparently the bloody emperor has been treating him coldly. However, he is not in any financial difficulty. Regarding that ruin within the kingdom, Archie and I did some research, but we haven't heard of any ruins in the area, or any cities in the past. Since it's a tomb, there ought to be some information about it left behind. Frankly speaking, I have no idea why there would be a tomb there. The only thing in the area is a small village, perhaps we could learn something if we asked around. What do you think? Can't do that. We were asked to keep our movements secret. The requester said that we were not to eliminate witnesses, and he hoped we would not have to do so. Of course, that region is crown-controlled territory. If we act rashly, we'll be making enemies of the Vaiself royal family of the kingdom. The fact that they were delving into a ruin in a foreign nation was practically a crime, which was why they had not hired adventurers, but workers. In other words, this is the usual dirty business, am I correct? Yes. However, there are some sensitive issues. Indeed. The empire's workers causing trouble in the kingdom will lead to all sorts of problems. If things go badly, it might even affect the Count himself. In that case, there's only one more problem left. That is, the origin of the information about the tomb, am I correct? Indeed. It smells fishy, no matter how you slice it. Does it? It's near the great forest of Tob, right? What if they found it while cutting down the forest? That would be strange. Look at this. Archie opened up a map and circled a certain location. The exact location is unclear, but it ought to be around this area. Her delicate finger slid over the map's surface, and then tapped twice. And then this is the village, though it's so small that perhaps it might be better to call it a hamlet instead. I don't think a village like that could clear-cut a forest. Indeed. A small village ought to have a hard time clearing a dangerous forest. Perhaps the kingdom cleared it for some national enterprise, but there's nothing nearby which would offer any national-scaled benefits nearby, and more to the point, no news about it has leaked out. The four of them were worried. They did not know if they should accept this assignment. Since they did not have an adventurer's guild to back them up, they had to thoroughly investigate the job themselves, starting with their employer's background and the location of the job. After that, they had to check out the details of the job itself before they could accept it. Even after doing all that, they still ran into trouble time after time. Their jobs were a gamble with their lives as the stake. 
No worker could do the job without telling themselves that no amount of checking was enough. If they sniffed out a hint of danger which they could not handle, then they would have to refuse the job, no matter how good the terms. I've done some checking on the payment side, and as for the deposit, Hecarin put a metal plate on the table. If they rejected the job, they would have to return it to the client. Various tiny characters were inscribed on its surface. I checked the credit plate with the Imperial Bank, and it's been fully paid up. We can exchange it for cash at any time. Credit plates were a guarantee of payment from the Imperial Bank that functioned like a check. They were intricately made as a countermeasure against forgery. Their drawbacks included being tedious to use and the fact that one had to pay processing fees to use them, but there were many advantages to them. The Adventurers Guild usually handled this sort of thing in other countries, but the country itself guaranteed this in the Empire. That means it's not a trap, all right. The truth is, I had the feeling that the other side was serious from the moment I got this plate. If they were planning to set a trap, then there would be no need to pay such a large deposit as a hiring fee, of course, the opposition might have done just that to catch people off guard, but Hecarin did not know this noble, and had no quarrel with him. I, stop. Imina, I'm not finished yet. I hope you can be a bit more flexible in your thinking. Fine, fine, fine. Then tell me something. There's a few questionable points about this job, like how the employer's hiring several teams. Why is that? Imina had a point. It would be unwise to use more than one team for a time-critical task, after considering the time needed to contact each of them. It defied explanation. I'm not sure. Frankly speaking, I don't know why they're in such a rush to check the place out. I haven't heard of any emergencies involving the Count, or anyone related to him, or any ceremonies to be hosted in the next few days. If you really wanted me to give an answer, maybe he's afraid of someone on the kingdom's side finding the ruins? And maybe hiring multiple teams was to increase the chances of success? Say, Hecarin? Didn't you ask Gringam about all that? As if he'd tell me that much. Just asking him if our client hired him took a lot of effort, and I had to keep our own info from leaking out. Hecarin shrugged, indicating that he was out of ideas. There's another possibility which is that someone is going up against the Count. That's possible. If that were the case, then the rushed investigation and hiring a lot of people would make sense. Right, right. Apparently, something big happened in the kingdom recently, but it doesn't seem to be directly connected to the ruins near Irantal. Tell us about it too, Rober. I didn't learn too much about it, only some rumors, Roberdick said and then he launched into a muddled explanation of the disturbance in the royal capital. Collecting more information would have taken time, but he lacked reliable information now. Hmm doesn't seem related, yet it seems related too. In any case, what Archie said is most likely. Plus, Rober agrees too. Assuming that's the case, considering the clients planning to hire multiple worker teams, and the fact that we're working in the kingdom's territory, are we going to end up competing with a lot of officially hired adventurers from the kingdom? If that's the case, then we're just wasting our time no matter how much info we gather within the Empire's borders. We also need to be wary of teams hired by another client, in other words, traitors. I don't want to end up getting stabbed in the back by our own side just as we think we've completed our task. Traitors or adventurers? If I had to choose, maybe adventurers might be better. At least you can reason with them and keep things from blowing up too much. After all, we might actually end up killing each other if it's between workers. What do you plan to do, leader? Everyone had said their piece. All that was left now was to try and figure things and end predict how they would go. Before I decide, I have something I want to say, or rather, something I want to ask. This is vital. Hecarin took a deep breath, and beside him, Imina sighed. Archie, a weird man was looking for you. Archie's face was initially blank, like a mannequin's, but at that moment, her brows twitched. Judging by her reaction, Hecarin was sure that she knew that person. That guy said something at the end, what did he say? Hecarin turned to Imina, and she immediately shot back a look which said, 
What are you playing at? In the end, she realized that Hecarin really did not remember, and she replied in a tired tone, Tell the Furt girl. The deadline's here. Or something along those lines. Everyone's eyes focused on Archie. She paused a beat, and then spoke in leaden tones. I owe him money. You owe him? Hecarin exclaimed in surprise. Of course, it was not just Hecarin, but Imina and Roberdick who were shocked as well. The money they made as workers was evenly divided among them, so they knew exactly how much each of their colleagues earned. When they thought about the payment they had received, it was hard to imagine she would end up owing someone money. How much do you owe? 300 gold coins. After hearing Archie's reply, everyone looked at each other again. This was an astounding amount, when one considered the amount of money a regular person made. Even workers of their caliber could not earn that much money in one go. The total payment for this job was 350 gold coins, but that was for the entire team. After deducting necessary expenses and turning them into a shared fund used to buy consumable items and other team resources, the remaining money would be divided among them. In the end, each person would only receive about 60 gold coins. Their team was quite highly ranked among the workers. If one went by the adventurer's ranking system, they would be around mithril rank. Yet even a group at their level could not make that much money in one payout. How had she come to owe so much money? Archie's expression turned gloomy. She had probably sensed everyone's doubtful gazes. It was only natural that she would not want to speak of it but she had no choice but to do so. If she decided to break off the discussion here, being expelled from the party was a perfectly understandable outcome. Perhaps she was worried about that problem, but in the end Archie finally spoke. I've kept quiet about this all this time, because it's a family shame, my family used to be nobles, but we were stripped of our status by the bloody emperor. The bloody emperor, Jerk Nivrun Farlord Elnix. Just like his nickname suggested, he was an emperor whose hands were stained with blood. His father, the previous emperor, had died and left his position empty. After that, he had broken ties with one of the five great nobles, in other words, the Empress Dowager's family, on suspicion of plotting to assassinate the emperor. After that, he killed his siblings one after the other. As though she had been caught up in the storm of death which swept the city, his mother had perished from an accident during this time as well. Of course, there had been opposition to him. However, the bloody emperor had taken control of the knights and their military prowess during his time as crown prince, so they were no match for him. Backed with overwhelming military might, he wiped out the influential nobles like he was scything down grain. In the end, all that remained were a group who pledged loyalty to the emperor on the surface, regardless of their true intentions and thus he had consolidated all power into himself. However, the bloody emperor did not stop there. He stripped many nobles of their social position in the name of weeding out incompetence. In contrast, talented individuals could be elevated to lofty heights, even if they were commoners, and thus he built the basis of his power upon that policy. There were two points about all this which awed those who witnessed this. The first was the masterful way in which he had orchestrated his purge of the nobles in such a way as to not diminish the power of the empire, despite the purge's scope. The second was that the emperor who had accomplished such an incredible feat was not yet fifteen years of age. Many nobles had fallen on hard times because of him. However, however, my parents are still living a noble lifestyle. Of course, we didn't have the money to support such a lifestyle so they had to borrow money from shady places to make ends meet. Hecarin, Imina and Roberdick looked at each other. Archie had hidden it well, but her voice was still flavored with a hint of annoyance, displeasure, and anger I'm confident in my magical abilities, please let me join. That was what the tiny, skinny girl, who clutched a staff that was taller than she was, had said to them. Hecarin was not the only one who recalled the dumbfounded way in which they had stared at her when she said that as well as the look of shock on their faces when they had seen the true power of Archie's magic. All these memories returned to their minds. Over two years had passed since that day, and they had gone through many adventures together. Yet, even after making a tidy sum of money from adventures fraught with the risk of death, 
Archie's equipment had not changed much. Now, they finally understood the reason for that. Seriously? Do you want us to go beat some sense into them? They need to hear the word of God. No, maybe they need to feel the fist of God first. Maybe their ears are all stuffed up, surely punching a hole in them would be more important. Please wait.